Sorry, thank you. Yeah, just sit in the back. Let's give folks a, a one more minute to run a, grab coffee and grab a donut and join us. There's there was a box. A box of donut holes. Yeah. Yeah, donut holes. Oh yeah. Oh, wait. I'm very interested in this subject. You know, I have had lots of problems how to bridge that gap. Yeah. And I kind of said that more. Uh, cool. Uh, I'm going to go back and help Brian and tell us about the site and help help site. Right. Yeah. Uh, Hi, I'm Vince. Sneaking into church, I'm not going to tell anybody down front to confess their sins. You can come up front if you want to go in the back. If you're more comfortable in the back, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not saying that this case is a lot of burden. You know what? Uh, sneak in the back or get the road. I've been on stage enough in my life where I know you want to suffer less. So well, I just, I'm going to have another you know, presentation in an hour and I'm going to have enough voice left. Uh, and what's, your, what's your background? Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little about me. So, my name is James Smith. I'm with Imitex. We are out of Vancouver, Canada, and I am in the LA office of uh, Imitex. Thanks for a couple of that. And uh, my background 
I have a, a, a bachelor's degree in economics. I have an MBA in finance, and I have a master's degree in financial accounting. That's in two years of medical research. And I started in analysis and wound up doing HTML, and wound up in web. So it sort of fell into backwards, but one of the languages I speak is business. And one of the things that I would always interested in uh, as an editor was writing line of communication. I was an editor of a paper in college, did a lot of writing, and had a couple of professors who really lit me up with certain ideas. And um, the more I uh, revisited those ideas, I found them very successful and they worked. And I've been sharing them ever since because they're just so amazing to me. Uh, what am I going? You know, trying to get pictures of whole class. Um, I'm originally from New Orleans, and I came to uh, LA about two and a half years ago for a little bit of dinner agency before I was downtown and advertising and digital, and I uh, rebranded myself now with uh, the Jimmy Jack. So, one of the things I noticed uh, as a project manager, um, thanks, Ryan, uh, leading web development was. The, the disconnect that, that we were just talking about, the how do you talk to your clients? How do you talk to your own team? Um, and then as a developer, it's very easy to say, do what I say to a machine. The machine will, and you realize, oh, I've got an unintended consequence here, and realize it did exactly what I said, I said it wrong, and I changed what I said, it now does what I want. But it's very you know, direct. There's no noise in the process other than how you say what you say, there's, there's no ambiguity. It does exactly what you want it to do. So if everything just goes out, you can correct that, and you've got complete control. And talking to another human being, all of that goes away. <laughs> so what's happened? This, uh, uh, this, this presentation came out of an idea of like, let's, let's start to address that and bring this up to the level of conversation and start to think. And you may hear me say those two things a lot, and that's something that I got from that same professor in undergrad who was talking about how you talk about issues, how you talk about problems. And one of the things you do is you make it okay to bring in your heart and heads, bring up the level of conversation, and reduce the stress and the tension about that thing. That, how do you talk about the elephant in the room? You start talking about it. You can make that okay. You open up room in the conversation. And we talked about that at the end of our course. And so that is, and so that's the communication process. So let's get to that. First thing is, when I'm writing a piece of code, I understand the interface on the level of the desk, the screen in front of me, the keyboard, I understand the output. That transacts to understand. A communication event between two human beings is not a cut and dry. And I found a handy diagram. Can we see that okay? Good. This diagram is, you'll see this all over the net. Not to this detail, this one I really like because it, it has a level of detail. At first, the two abstracts can come across you as noise, which is there in the middle of the diagram. And we're going to talk about this diagram. The first two things that are going to happen in a communication event is you understand, you start at the top of the diagram, the field of experience. When you sit down with a computer, you have an exact match its field of experience and yours. Its field of experience is what you told it to. You've defined the environment. So you have an exact match. When you talk to another human being, you don't have an exact match. It takes a little bit of conversation, just like you were talking at the beginning of where you're from, what you do. That is you and I starting to take our perceptual frame and finding each other one. So you ask me, tell you a little bit about me. That's you. When you need a cue in a conversation, where's the overlap? So as a broker, are you, are you making your own trades? Are you calling? Making my own. So I'm not really a broker. So I don't really deal. I call clients. I'm just a right. major bank trader. So a bank trader only trades. So I don't really have to deal with clients at all. Right. So you don't have you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with clients. Right. So you don't have to deal with Jump in on this opportunity. I think it's a great opportunity. They are doing the same thing. They are trying to get someone on the phone. They want to 
an electrical current and find the channel communications that are going to work for a successful transaction and to be successful by their end. This is the same thing. How do you make that communication change the plan so it's successful? How do you see what the problems are? How do you understand the nature of problems? And you're going to have that So understanding this, this concept of a, a field of experience. If you and I don't speak the same language, we're never going to be able to align our field of experience. Uh, I'm, I'm a geek, I'm a fan of Star Trek, and the reason there's a great line in Star Trek V where Dr. McCoy comes up to Spock with a constant joke between the two of them, and uh, he's kneeling and he says, Well, I, why don't we have a conversation? Like, you've been to the other side and back, life and death, and Spock says, We have a common frame of reference. How can we have a possible conversation about this? And it's a joke in the movie, but this is what he's talking about. And that, you know, when you talk about debate, people say, you know, you can't let your opponent frame the debate. Frame the reference. And that's what they were referring to. Everything in your life comes through a filter. It's your perceptual frame, and that's what this is as well. So if your perceptual frame is English, and mine is Spanish, it's going to be hard for us to find the overlap to have successful communication. So you need you know, a potential companion, Where's the overlap? What is your perceptual plan? How does that all work? If we look at the preferences, this filter, you because when you're working with the machine with code, that's very limited. But language itself is completely abstract. You were not born knowing how to code, you learn that. The language is the same, and we're wired to be able to learn. But it's complete abstraction. The words coming out of my mouth are an amalgamation that you and I both understand from the context of culture, how we were raised and where. Purely abstract. Just by accident of birth, you and I understand each other. Or by the of learning of our parents. So language is an abstract. You think when you're born, you're aware of the world around you, you respond to it. They're very interactive with the world around them. You see these big eyes soaking everything in. They don't have the motor skills or the, the neural development to speak yet. But they will interact with you. They'll point at something. They'll make a noise. They understand you are responding to them as they act in the environment. And eventually, the neural pathways and musculature develops so they can make specific words and communicate to people. Oddly enough, Gross motor skills develop first. And in recent years, there have been teaching parents use sign language with their kids. They say hey a lot, they have a ton of them. And they will learn eat, drink, their name very, very quickly. And the, yeah, more. That's right, that's right. I have a, I have a deaf cousin, so I learned sign language uh, to, so I could talk with her. And I was going to visit her again. And I said, Daddy, look, I, I'm learning sign. I'm learning sign. And she said, I don't sign. <laughs> I didn't see Dottie back here. I remember Dottie because when I was little, he was my cousin who talked sign, but would feed me cookies all day long. I love Dottie, my mother can die. He said, well, the past she gave me cookies because I would just bounce off the wall so I didn't drive home so many miles. But I can learn sign language in college. So uh, this was my own personal you know, experience of, of understanding communication and as I got into this world, Spent many times, a long time in the deaf community, um, and we spent hours with, with deaf friends doing nothing but signing, and then my roommate would come home and say, Hey James, and I'm like, That's my name! You, you just said my name out loud the first time all day. It, it, it would shift mentally. Uh, it was very attractive. And again, it's the frame of reference, the sudden change. So you have a broad frame of reference, and you have to have it. Ellen Greenspan talks about that as um, an ideology. Everyone has an ideology. You have a general model in your mind of the world. And everything, every piece of information, everything visual, not just watching the news, not just reading the newspaper, this, the stimulus that I'm giving you now, information, is data coming into your brain through a perceptual frame that you have created that comes from your culture, your language, your experience. So that's why you're looking at these other lines. The closer you can get these old lines, the 
more successful you'll have the, the communication that you need. So let's look at the process for a second. What happens is very much like when you're vetting them, you have an idea. Ideas are enriched by the addition of language. But you don't need language to have ideas. As an infant, you think you're aware you have ideas, but there could be more images. Uh, there's a, a really great speaker out of a really crazy series, Temple Blandon. Did any of you about her a long ago? She is amazing. Uh, she is an autistic woman with a PhD, uh, very successful, but out of low blind, and she will bring you into the mental process of autism and, and understanding your own thought process in your own brain in a way that is fundamentally uh, just, just amazing, at least to me, I'm a geek and I, I will admit I'm a wife that doesn't laugh. She describes an event where she was driving from San Diego to LA for one conference to the next, and at a corner garage she sees a deer, she sees five thousand her commercial, it's just after, and it's coming across the road. So she knows there's going to be an intersection between her car and this animal. And she doesn't describe a thought process of, oh, I, you know, I need to do this or this. She said, I saw three images in my mind. The first was me hitting the brake, my, my foot on the brake, and the animal passing in front of the car. The second was me hitting the accelerator, and the animal passing behind the car. And the third was me doing nothing, and the animal hitting the car. And she responded to that image. She, does, she will tell you, I did not think of in words to do this, this, and this. You saw it in images. All of us do the same thing. When you translate those images into words, the abstraction, the image you see is, is concrete. The words are an abstraction. And the evidence for that is the fact that there are multiple languages around the planet. I can say the same thing in a dozen languages. Different words can mean the exact same thing. That's, that's almost the very definition of an abstraction. But the image, what that is. They can eat the bear. Everyone on the planet has to eat it. Yet I can describe it with different words. It can be the exact same thing. The image of that, the action of that, is identical with every individual. So that's your source and encoding. When we start on the back, I have an idea, I encode it. English, Spanish, PHP. And I'm going to then communicate. That's my channel. We talk about channels in marketing, in business. We talk about channels in web. Web is a channel to an audience. At the other end, now we're moving to the other side of the diagram, is the receiver. That receiver has to look at the information, hear the information. They're going to, it's going to come through their perceptual frame. And that perceptual frame is going to influence how they decode that information back to the image in their mind. Five steps from me talking to you just now. I mean, it sounds really simple. You hear my voice, you understand. But this is what's happening right now across the room, from my mouth to your ears, actually my brain to your brain. And at each point, noise can enter the process. We describe noise in photography as images getting fuzzy. We describe noise in web as you know, things that interfere with the message. That's exactly the same. So uh, a good example of that uh, perceptual frame, in, I'm, I'm from the deep south, I'm from the north. So if you say fries and gravy to me, that, that's a foreign concept. In Canada, the company I work with, uh, that's one of the things they use very common. I'm using the biscuits and gravy. So when you say fries and gravy to me, the image, when I decode that, I see song of gravy, which is what I put on biscuits, over McDonald's fries and thinking, oh um, yeah, you wouldn't try it. I've had it. It's good. <laughs> but that's not the image they have. And that's not the image they have when they said that to me. They're thinking of the place down the street which has a very different kind of gravy and fries. So it's, it's not quite like chili cheese fries, but you're in the same neighborhood. Um, and again, the perceptual frame, my familiarity with, with another thing, the chili cheese fries, allows me to abstract it out and go, I think this is probably related. And that perceptual frame allows for that, that 
relational thing. You go, okay, I don't know what price and gravy is, but maybe it's like that. Sure, we'll go. We'll try. Otherwise, it becomes too foreign. It's very much like when uh, Spaniards arrived in this continent and were riding horses. That was outside of the perceptual frame of Native Americans. It was enormous out there. Uh, and they saw this as one entity, man and horse combined, because it was completely foreign to them. There was nothing they could even abstract to, to, to grab and say, maybe it's like that. So, again, the, the, you'll see this reference to perceptual frame coming back over and over. And this, this idea of the noise in the channel. One of the ways we address that is down here at the bottom of, of the diagram, the feedback loop. The response you get from someone you're talking to, the, which is not just verbal. As, a, as, it, as each of you is sitting here, I can observe the expression on your face, how you're sitting, you're leaning forward, leaning back, your occasional you know, droopy eyes, your occasional glassy eyes. All of that is feedback. All that's non-verbal. Huge part of the communication process. Okay. Any questions on this? All right. Being aware of the noise in the process, where that comes in, and how many times it can come in, this thing I want to highlight so I can run this little slide to give you a little you know, moment of levity. This is, this is how you, know, you tell your girlfriend, your, your mom, your wife, or whoever, you know, bring me home some fruit from the store, and she comes back and says, that's not what I asked for. Well, sure. It's you know she brought home bananas and you wanted apples. Your perceptual frames didn't line up. There was noise in the process. This is the result. So when when it gets really noisy, you can say, "All right, come on back, come on back, come on back," and you hear crunch. Uh, okay, too far. <laughs> when someone's backing up their truck and they you know, they hit the house, so you got to watch the noise in the process. So the communication itself. How many of you are surprised by this diagram? This is from the guy you see a lot. I was I was just flabbergasted the first time I saw this. Less than 10% of the message that is successfully communicated is the word you use. Tone and body language of the story. And the reason why is language is a new affectation. We are a biological organism. We are an organic computer. We lived without language for millions of years. We had a way to communicate that we wouldn't necessarily call high-level language, that we might call rudimentary language. You can still see lower primates and higher primates do the same thing today. The communication is body language. It is tone. You'll see groups of primates communicating with each other just by moving, just by smiling. Passed around 30 or 40 higher primates. They haven't said a word to each other, yet all of them now have the same idea. They communicate with each other. You and I have that biological root built into the computer. Uh, Carl Sagan, go ahead. Is this just a verbal and vocal effect? Is verbal noise the only one that I can Yes. Uh, verbal would be the language, I believe. Yeah, verbal is going to be the word I right. think so. Vocal is how I say it, how loud they have to say it. The, the tone. Um, one of the things that I often say is I learned from the audience in my presentation, so one of the things that just pointed out to me, noise in the communication between the frames is, again, my thought of that word that uh, came through to you was that's a noise thing. And thank you for pointing that out. So I'm going to change that to say specifically the tone. That's my head and my head there. So again, I really appreciate that. This is an opportunity for an example. Did you see either of the last two slides of the AP? Yes! With the sign language, that is really what they do with this. I love that they saw this. Like what they do with the English song. Yeah. They, they developed a whole language of you know, gestures and you know, like movements and how it's like fascinating. Yeah. Um, and as someone who, who does a little sign language, is a little rusty, um, I really appreciated how much they, they were authentic in, in that as well. Um, I, I read some of the studies on. Um, and as a 
my student uh, or here today is a description of graduate school and some of the great professors we have across because I had those guys, but uh, he will also take you into you know, the consciousness of another living being that is not human, that understands humor, that talks about the things they see. He, he describes how the apes in the compound are taught each other sign language, and they'll be looking around, they'll look around, and they're just sitting there like, you know, uh, like an animal. You know, look at that red car. The bananas today. They have conversations. It's, uh, it's really, really funny. They'll, you know, he'll talk about his sense of humor. Uh, once you always jump up on him and start giggling, he realizes his pants are wet. And it may be bathroom humor, but, or maybe primate humor, but that was her joke. And there was another instance that was really amazing. Again, the wire, being aware that we've got this, we've got another computer and we forget that there's a wire in, in, in red. We, we have our Thoughts constantly running. It's difficult to disconnect from that and realize those thoughts are run through a hardwired system, and that's going to affect it in certain ways. He describes one instance where an ape was adopted by a family, and they get uh, they raise it as a pet, and it becomes very interactive, almost like a family member, by many pets, but at a much higher level of interaction than a dog or a cat. And this ape was fond of sneaking in the kitchen and grabbing a cookie, but could not. Stop himself from responding as by instinct. The instinct to go boom <clears throat> when they found something, a good tasty treat, which is what you would do as an ape in the wild to communicate to the others, oh, fish food over here. So every time he sneaks in the kitchen, very, very quiet, he goes, oh, that's a cookie jar, reach in, and he sneaks in the kitchen, boom, and everyone knew he was in the cookie ceiling, and in the kitchen ceiling, cookie. Couldn't stop it. We are wired. So that there are certain things we're going to respond to. And that's part of that perceptual frame and part of this primitive culture. So, understanding now that we've got a, a model of communication, we understand noise, we understand you know, idea encoding, channel decoding, and, uh, and, and uh, the other idea, the other end, do they match? Now we can start to narrow down the communication process to understanding things a bit more likely. Conflict. What's the nature of conflict? For the most part, if I had the highest level of abstraction, I can reduce conflict to the difference between expectations and reality. And the easiest way to prove this to yourself and study it is to look at your response in the car when you're driving. When the person in front of you or next to you does something you don't expect, you experience a moment of conflict. And that's either fear because it's dangerous or annoyance because they just shouldn't do that. Uh, there was you know, a comedian in LA who was really funny. He says, There wouldn't be road rage, man, if the person in front of you could just freaking go. And it, it, that's it. You, when you're in the car, this is a great way to study this. And any communication process in conflict and expectations, expectations in reality. Also, you can't think that for a while. The, you have now reduced your frame of reference. To something smaller, you're saying, I'm in a car, I'm a vehicle, part of another vehicle, we are all moving in a pattern, which is like a model of just how we're, we're talking now. We're moving in a pattern and communicating and trying to see what the frame of reference is. Your assumption is everyone else on the road knows the rules and is obeying the rules the way you do. And the difference in that perceptual frame, the degree to which they don't obey those rules, becomes the nature of conflict. When things match our expectations, we don't have conflict. When things exceed our expectations, that's a surprise and it's a good thing. So we're usually happy about that. But that's not conflict. When, when reality is below our expectations, it's reactive. Then we experience conflict. And so if you study the car, you see yourself reacting. The interesting thing is, related to your response to that, your emotional response, your emotive response, um, and how that happens as well. Because we can break that, we can in analysis, we can break that process down and understand it. So your clients, your colleagues, when you have conflict at work, uh, either yourself or you're generating, ask yourself what's the gap between my expectations in reality or their expectations in reality? Am I addressing them? In terms of business, the simplest thing to do is start to address. As soon as you see there is going to be a gap. Start to address it. You tell the client, okay, 
Nothing's come up. We had a server crash, or I had a developer get sick, or I had a developer's wife had baby, and they're out. I've lost a resource for a full day or for a full week, which means my schedule has been impacted. I told you to expect delivery on Friday. That's now going to change. And I know that on Monday. So rather than wait for Friday and go, oops, <laughs> now I'm going to change lanes in front of you with, without signaling, uh, you give them a heads up. You adjust their expectations early before you get to that point where the, the, the gap is going to be this, this ultimate staccato event. What do you mean? I've got other things in place. Um, and economics is really fun to talk about. The advent of new money and extra money isn't what changes your spending habits. You don't get it. Unless you're in Vegas and suddenly full believer and have 1500 bucks in your hand. Uh, in that event, yes, you, you will change your spending habits that instant. But when you're told by, by research shows that when people are told there's going to be ways that money is coming, there's going to be a change in your cash flow. You have been told to expect a change. Before that change actually arrives, your spending habits change. And you can measure it and show it over and over. So you, you turn in your tax refund, and you, you see the number on the bottom, like, aha, I got an extra thousand bucks. Most people don't wait for that check to come in the mail. So what happens is they've adjusted their behavior to match reality when reality arrives. Which is why, as soon as you can, your clients, colleagues, you let them know. I need to adjust your expectations. You manage that gap. That's one of the things, the things we did in business school over and over again. We manage every relationship, your boss, your the people you supervise, your clients. You look for the gap, manage it. When the gap is below expectations. In reality, when the gap is below expectations, that's the gap you have to manage. If you see it, the goal. You don't have to manage that. Meet it, your goal. That's that. You're always looking for where's the gap. That's what I'm going to do. What do you do with people who are, well, anybody in the room, I'm pretty sure you know this. People are, most people I feel like are terrified of talking. Yeah, yeah. it's the only one. And, and so I'm very interested in how do you get a team to get a more conflict? And I don't mean fighting, I just mean right. the kind of thing you're talking about, you know, especially lower level employees. They may have great ideas, but they're just kind of scared. And you want them to speak up. How do you, I don't know if anybody has anything to say about that. How do you encourage a person who you know is valuable, but would be a lot more valuable if they could step up and you know, be a little more confrontational about the work or about their needs or about the process that they're going through? I think it's a really difficult challenge that I've never really figured out how to get those people to step Show and be more active in the communication process. So, I've got some good ideas this year. I want to ask if uh, anybody else. That's why I'm going to have the whole room. Do you have anything to say about that? Yeah. You know, this, you have a single pain point? Um, I find like at the junior level, like someone in my tech stack, let's say somebody working underneath me and getting an intern, taking them out to lunch and just work on their, take it out of work, work on their. Dude, you just told me this great idea over lunch, but the whole team just missed out on that idea from me. When we did the stand up on Friday, you should have said that we should move this from there to there because you didn't just, especially if they have a reason for it. Mm -hmm. like it's not just, I feel like I should move to the left, but if I move it to the left, we get this goal, this goal, and this goal. I find that just telling those people, try and do it in a non confrontational way. Get them to do it in an area where they're comfortable, just within their peers, just in our stand-up insider shop. Find out if they put on the spot in front of the customer, that guy either shuts down or he's he my team. That's right, it's too risky. He feels that he's going to ruin a $10,000 project by opening his mouth, where if we're working on the, the same project internally, he feels that if we just shut him down, you know, it's whatever. But I also find that if you What's happened is you've given him data, which he's adding to his perceptual frame. And that perceptual frame says, I'm not part of this process. I'm not a mark. So I've withdrawn from the communication. I've withdrawn from the conversation. I'm not listening, but yeah, I'm not engaged. I'm okay. 
First, have you ever had? <laughs> Anybody that was in the water, it almost looks like that. Right. 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 Right.
or you take the time to say, you know, and it's painful, but you've got a stack of work to do, and, and, and all you look, look at the Bible, like, there's no way I'm getting out of this Bible problem. And you know, thank the Holy Spirit that God's moving around here. Um, and in order to, to, to be quiet, and you try to be right back on it, not just the words. I don't know, so you say, yeah, yeah, thanks, I'll get back to you. They get it. Because only 7% was the words you used. If you said something like, you said it in a rude way, they got that message. You got it all. So be sincere, raise it to the level of conversation, allow it to be in the present tense, make it part of your culture, build confidence, and say, I appreciate you bringing that to me, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I can't explore that right now. Um, I can't develop this idea with you right now. I can't, uh, this is some, something I want to work on you with, either in the communication process. On our communication process, which has to be valuable. So I have to tell you, you're a valuable person, communication here is valuable. Because if I don't, I allow, I'm building noise in my own company. I'm building noise in my own process that's going to wind up with that ship on the rocks. Because it all adds up. It's not the big decisions you make, it's the tiny little decisions. So it doesn't, you know, the notion doesn't come down all at once. It's one drop of one grain at a time. So keep this little drop, and it's added. Several phrases, yours and theirs. So opening that space up, present tense, part of the conversation. Let's move on. Is there, is there one go with that? This is another one of those things that I, was one of my wow moments. Another way to prove that language is completely abstract. I can reduce any emotion you name. To one of six abstract categories. But even more than that, every human being on the planet will express those six categories physically with the, the tone, with the body language, in exactly the same way. Every infant on the planet will express confusion, anger, you know, uh, sadness, exactly the same. Not just humans, every primate will make these. Expressions. We are wired this way. So when you're in that communication event, when you're having a frustrating moment, pause, ground yourself, and think, what's going on? What, what's happening together? You're asking yourself, remember, there's no, there's five steps between my brain and that one. There's noise here and there. And remembering, it's tone and body language, and remembering is feedback. What am I seeing? Uh, is this person afraid? Shame, kind of sad now. Uh, but this was, I, I put these in this order because this is how this works introduced to me. Even though the, the diagram I could find uses disgust and surprise, uh, uh, fear. Having sad mad, afraid, shame, confused are the six basic human emotion states. So when you're assessing that conflict, question one, what's the gap? Question two, what is the emotive state I'm dealing with? And this, this, is, this is where it gets really crazy. Um, I don't have to know if someone's pissed, peeved, miffed, angry, curious. All of that is mad. So I can reduce it to all, I only have to answer one of six things. But they can be a combination. Each of these six emotive states has a physical energy with it, which is why you see them express physically, which is why we communicate with body language and tone. Happy is Feels good that energy's coming out. So that one's not, not going to be difficult to manage. Sad is, is sort of drawing in. You know, it's a depressing thing on the desktop. Angry is something that comes out. Afraid, again, an inward flow. I want to be small, I want to be seen. Ashamed, inward flow. I want to be small, I want to be seen. Accused, an inward flow. So, depending on your own or your audience, or your, your, your kids, this is a great way to If you have children or work with children, you can experience multiple emotive states at once. And what happens is a child, especially who doesn't have maturity, doesn't have experience, will be afraid, ashamed, and confused, and it makes them sad. And so they act angry. They're not mad. But that's the only way all of that energy can come back out. 
all of that is coming in, which the, the, the sad, the shame, the crazy, all that's coming in, it just gets too much, and you don't know what to do. As an adult, we have mental controls, you know, most of us, depending on our know, skills and our maturity, to, to restrain ourselves. You know, we, you, you can observe childlike behavior again in the car when someone cuts you off or you cut them off, they tell you you're number one. <laughs> Uh, they've, they've let that down a little bit, but you're communicating on a more raw level. So, again, ask them. When I'm talking to this person and I'm seeing there's a gap, there's conflict, what are the emotions of this? Because the emotions are the noise now in the process. Clients want to feel better. They want to feel confident. They want the fear to go away. They want the confusion to go away. They want the sadness to go away. And these are things that are making them angry. They want to be happy. Many times, being heard restores confidence. Telling them facts, managing that gap is the best way to address fear. I'm afraid this isn't going to work. I'm afraid you're not going to be on time. Uh, Raise me to the level of the conversation in present tense. When they say, I'm afraid my boss is not going to like it, now you're not in a position where you can directly solve that problem for them. Give them a shoulder to cry on. You can give them a sympathetic ear. You're in a certain time box because you have to get back. But you're supporting the relationship, you're removing noise from the relationship, and removing it going forward. You're building confidence. You're aligning those perceptual frames with every transaction. So when you look at your children and what they're doing, what is the emotive state you're doing? When you look at your clients, when you look at your boss, when you look at your colleagues, when you look at the people you supervise. So look at gap. I'm going to look at the difference between expectations and reality. I'm going to look at the nature of the conflict. And I want to ask myself, what is the emotion I'm dealing with? And I don't have to name it specifically. I just need to have it just generally. And that's enough for me to target in, like, from your body language, I'm guessing you're a little confused. Or you look really angry. Or are you feeling, you can even, if someone's afraid, it's very difficult for them to say, I'm afraid. Culturally, we're taught not to say that. But you can open up the space for communication. By saying, tell me what's going on. Present tense, level of conversation. You can open a space in the conversation and you invite that feedback. It's like, uh, from my language, I'm wondering, are you okay? Tell me what you think. What do you think is happening? Um, so, I think, what do you think? Invite the conversation, invite the feedback. Open the space, make it okay. And if you can't quite, the people, my brother is really good at this. He, he could be a champion poker player in Vegas. He can't tell at all the level of emotional turmoil that is going on underneath until he just explodes into it. So, uh, some people do that. Some people have a very good affect or a disconnect until they reach that level and it's, it's like someone's like, go to that thing, boom. So, opening that up, you know, again, adding it to perceptual frame, reducing the noise, making it part of the culture, rather than level of conversation. Tell me what's going on. What do you think? I'm observing this in my world. That's another important thing. Checking in. Saying, look, uh, you can't help but observe when I got home tonight, honey, you know, talking to your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, that you know, you're in the kitchen cutting the onions and crying, and either the onions affected you or you had a bad day. And I don't want to assume which it is. Give me some feedback. Or they're not cutting onions and they're still crying, and you say, What's wrong? You usually get a no thing. I'm like, okay. Now you have to go back to your sales training and overcome the first objection. That was the first objection. You asked for the feedback and you said, you know, would you like to make a purchase? They said no. First rule of sales is you ignore the first objection. <laughs> you write on your own. And the way to do that is say, I've observed, you know, this, this, and this. So this, all these things tell me that something's wrong. And you're avoiding the defensive behavior and the person you're talking to. Not saying you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing that. Because when we hear that, the wiring makes us defensive. No, I'm not. You know, when you do nothing, especially with little ones, when you say, I see you running through the house with a can of gas and the matches my hair before you roll, what are your intentions? It's hard for them to go, uh, yeah, okay, you got me. Um, try to avoid the defensive behavior and overcome the objection. So these are some of my takeaways. Um, the 
last thing I can leave you with is I'm giving you a model for conflict. I'm giving you a model for production. I'm giving you a model for a conversation with that transaction. The last model I can give you in the toolbox is the emotional process itself. What causes emotions? Where do they come from? I can break it down into A, B, C, and D. First of all, that's about that. And this helps you zero in on what's going on and how to, how to do it. First thing, A, for activating an event. There is some independent variable. Something happens. Someone cuts you off. Again, in the car, this is a great way to say Someone cuts you off. B, there's something you believe about this independent variable that makes it relevant to you. The fact that someone got cut off in traffic in Japan has nothing to do with you. So it's outside of your perceptual frame. You're not going to respond. So the person cutting you off right here, you believe they should follow the rules. You believe they shouldn't have done that. They've got the perceptual frame. C, causes an emotional response. They have done something unexpected. Reality doesn't have an expectation. There's a gap. Um, they have done something dangerous. I'm now experiencing that was, that was hazardous. I'm afraid. I don't know. When I see one mistake, I start looking for more. If I'm reviewing something, if I'm editing something, first mistake slows me down. I'm like, okay, how many more are there? Because they're this small. So when I see a driver do that, I'm now changing my perceptual frame to think either this guy just suddenly needed to get over, or they need to be better, or they need to be wrong. So I'm now confused, afraid, confused, and generating an emotional response out of an activity that the belief caused. D is for discount. When you're dealing with someone, and we all do this, when you're dealing with yourself, you dis the only way that the, the cause comes from D, A is an independent event. The cause is an independent event. B, the belief. Your belief, their belief. That's the dependent variable that you can control, that you can address. When your client says, I'm afraid, I have a belief that says I'm afraid. You can address that. D, discount. Is that a rational belief? Is that a self-defeating belief? Ask yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm upset because I need a pickle for dinner, and I believe pickles go with every meal, and there's not one on the plate. Have you set yourself up for this emotional response, for this, this, this wonderful display of embarrassment for your wife, or your whomever your significant other is at a public restaurant, based on a belief that is being self-defeating? Or irrational? And if so, can you discount it and let it go away? Can you find yourself in conflict? Because you can support yourself more than anything else. And when you support yourself in that communication process, then, then you have to increase the chance for success in that. So ask yourself, is this belief self-defeating? Is it irrational? So how, how do I feel? Have you said and have reached change of truth? What is it I believe that makes me feel have you said and have reached change of truth? Can that belief be changed? Or is it a core belief that cannot be changed? The firmness of the earth, the of gravity, very difficult to change. You can probably do it. You might end up in a rubber room somewhere. But, but again, an example of abstraction and the machine we're dealing with, with the human brain, we can start with reality of perception. So as you change, you can discount that belief, you can change the emotive state. You can change your own emotive response. You can find your depressed, you don't want to be, you find you're sad, you don't want to be. You find this is a cycle in your life, you want to continue, but that's one way to change it. You find it in your heart, you find it in your plan. What's the other state? What's the name of the conflict? Is there noise? It's causing it. What is their belief that is causing the other state? That is relative to the gap. I know what the gap is, the active energy gap. How can I discount that belief? First of your belief. Take your confusion to understand. These are my takeaways, and if you want, I'm going to post the deck. You can look us up at Image Decks. We are in Vancouver and Canada, and, uh, Los Angeles. We do higher ed web, and we do nonprofits. About 200 sites in 2006. Um, those, are, those are our main verticals. And uh, I'm, I am uh, coming to Image Decks recently from another company. Support. They have a culture that says, let's look at the problem and talk about it. 
bring us to the perfect time. If it continues to be a problem, let's what are the next steps? I want you to write for me what you're going to do to avoid the problem in the future. So we're going to establish accountability. We're going to do it within a process. So that's our time, guys. Do we have any questions? Anything else? Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you all for joining me. Feel free to email me if you wish uh, with any further questions or follow up. John, thank you for being the first to move forward. I appreciate that. <laughs> I know that. I know that. I appreciate you coming on the musician that I know that you have been sitting in the back. You know, you forward, so. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, do you guys have a. I've been to yours. Do you guys have some plugin in the bill? Some cool plugins that you might have stumbled on? I've, I've been to your site and recognized your logo. So I'm just wondering how I might have done that. I'm taking out some personal plugins or something. They do. The uh, shop has developed a few uh, modules, and um, I'll be honest, probably the one of the most famous ones is our Open EDU, which is a special set of modules put together to deal with uh, the higher education, um, you know, the business model of University A could be identical to the business model of University B. Which is the way in which they generate cash flow, the way they generate. Problems they have to the level of administration, the administration structure, and then, yeah. So, we're addressing their workflows. Part of them reinventing the wheel from scratch every time we say, We know these things are going to address what you need. Yeah. And if you don't use them necessarily want or need all of them, just turn them off. But they're here, they're available in the same package. So, we can, we can build that in, take that into the end, and they're ready to work to turn And we're going to do it again. Right. So, are you guys, are you guys, Building uh, you know sites or networks for universities, nonprofits, or what are you actually doing? It? You mentioned a little bit of higher education nonprofits. What do you what do you actually do with them? You know I mean? We do build sites, talk about them, but yeah, uh -huh. um, the enrollment, um, the immigration, um, excuse me, migration. Yeah. All Drupal. All Drupal. All Drupal. And uh, so the you know from from you know cradle to grave. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, one of my favorite things we've had. Right. Have a good one.
All right, just, just so you know, um, anybody in the back row uh, in the next presentation has to leave to sing along. <laughs> so you're welcome. I really appreciate you step back. I hope you can sing and know lots of songs. So this is the Willie Nelson concert. Is anyone in the wrong place? All right, Paul, way to go. And let me change.